We welcome uh, a wonderful guest from uh, the Vatican, and we celebrate today the beginning of the year of the Aquinas Center when we're celebrating ecumenism and interfaith dialogue. Just a little brief thing about the Aquinas Center. We see our focus as exploring the living Catholic tradition by promoting unexpected conversations for the common good. So hopefully this evening will be one of those unexpected conversations. We may hear things that might startle us. We may hear things that may make us think. Unexpected conversations for the common good. My name is Sister Mary Priniski. I'm a Dominican sister. My mother house is in Adrian, Michigan. And I have been asked to be the interim director of the Aquinas Center as we are exploring where we need to be in the context of our world today. So pray for us these next months as we figure that out. Enjoy this evening. I want to just acknowledge a few people who are here, more groups than individual people. The board of the Aquinas Center is here, so I want to acknowledge their presence. We also want to... The other day I was at an event with, the pres with President Stirk and she, used to, she kept saying, hold your applause until the end. So how about if we do that? Appl hold your applause until the end. Um, we also want to thank those who have financially supported the Aquinas Center, uh, particularly those who have supported this particular event. I also want to welcome the alumni of the Candler School of Theology this evening, along with members of Candler's Board of Advisors who met today and the Committee of 100. I'd like to... Okay. I'll try stepping back a little. Uh, we have a, a group of people who came from St. Thomas More Parish as a body, and so I just want to acknowledge their presence with us this evening. I um, also want to acknowledge Emory's faculty, staff, and volunteers. Uh, there are many people who have helped pull this together this evening, and there are a number of volunteers that we really want to thank for their presence here. And then finally, the students at Cristo Rey Jesuit High School that you met on your way in. They were here to welcome you, and they also helped you get here to find where the right door is, how to get from the parking lot. So we really want to thank the Cristo Rey students who are with us tonight, and all who have come because this would not have happened if you did not participate. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Claire Sturck. On September 1st in 2016, Dr. Sturck became Emory, Uni Emory University's 20th president. A pioneer public health scholar, Dr. Sturck has served for the past two decades as a social scientist, academic leader, and administrator at Emory. She is globally renowned thought leader whose work has deepened our understanding of social and health disparities, addiction and infectious diseases, community engagement, and the importance of mentoring and empowering women leaders. President Sturk will in introduce our special guest. And President Sturk, we thank you for joining us. Well, good evening and one more welcome to all of you. I'm very proud because Emory is a special place, a special place for many, many reasons. And one of those is our collective commitment to engage in what we call difficult conversations. The Emory community is committed to discussing topics about which opinions may be divided. One such topic is religion. Hence, we are committed to address an urgent need in today's world, namely facilitating different faith traditions to achieve greater understanding of one another and working towards justice for all. Emory has a long history of leading in the field of faith and religion. We do so through our teaching, research, and scholarship, our healthcare, our community engagement, and our vibrant support for religious diversity. It is in this context that I acknowledge the very difficult time in the life of the Roman Catholic Church. 
it is possible, I would dare say probable, that many loyal Catholics are feeling the pain, maybe even open wounds, related to the disgrace of clergy sexual abuse among minors. Sexual abuse is a heartbreaking crime. Every victim of sexual abuse deserves our love, support, and understanding, and that's especially true for children. The Catholic Church is facing an essential turning point. The eyes of the world are on the church and its leaders. The growing expectation for greater accountability, transparency, and reform is evident. We all hope and pray for a just outcome. But let's also remind each other that to stand in solidarity with the victims is not to condemn the church as a whole or to pass judgment on any individual absent due process. As we learn more about what happened, what will be done, the world is looking for meaningful action, action that's not guided by unfounded judgment. During times of great stress and tension, this special responsibility to support informed discussion is more important than ever. Now let me move on to the special honor of welcoming His Eminence, Cardinal Kurt Koch, and his work is very well known to many of you. He was born in Switzerland. Before walking in, we talked about how we grew up not too far from each other in different countries in Western Europe. He was ordained to the priesthood in 1982, consecrated bishop in 1997, and since 2010, he has served as the president of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. Throughout his years and many years of incredible leadership, Cardinal Koch has exemplified a commitment to authentic ecumenism. He has brought leaders from different faiths into groundbreaking conversations, conversations that people at times thought would not be possible. He knew how to bring them together. For example, he co-presided over a key meeting of the Joint International Commission for Theological Dialogue bringing together the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. Or another example, in his role as president of the Pontifical Commission of Religious Relations with the Jews. In talking with those of you who have followed and studied his work, I have learned that the Cardinal grounds his interfaith efforts in several core principles. I will close by highlighting two of those principles. First, charity, precedes theology. Put simply, put in the words that came to my mind, I would say, actions speak louder than words. And kind actions, acts of compassion, are essential in today's world. Second, dialogue matters. Even, or especially when, the topic is challenging. We must continue talking with one another, engaging with each other. Doing so will open doors to deeper understanding of our complex, diverse, and global community. At Emory, we too believe in conversations that matter. We believe that the willingness to have difficult conversations across faith traditions, ethnicities, political affiliations, and more remains central to our mission as a leading university, as an institution of higher education. It captures what we are as a community, we are only as strong as our relationships, and relationships require courage. Cardinal Koch, welcome to Emory University. While the Cardinal is getting ready for his talk, just to remind you, if you have questions, there are cards in your pews. If you would write them down, the students from Cristo Way will pick those up after the Cardinal's lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, my heartfelt thanks to the Candler School of Theology, the Aquinas Center, and the Emory University in Atlanta for the kind invitation to speak in this eminent institution on the significance of the ecumenical movement today. I'm very much aware 
that my visit to Atlanta and to the, U the USA occurs at a time when the Roman Catholic Church finds itself in a very difficult situation because of the crime of sexual abuse and is experiencing a grave crisis. I do not know the situation in the USA from personal experience as you do. And therefore, I would be presumptuous on my part to express a concrete position on the issue. I would like instead to give expression to my conviction gained during 15 years as a diocesan bishop in Switzerland before being called to Rome. During that time, I learned that dealing with the grave problem of abuse must be placed at the top of the agenda of the church because it otherwise overshadows all other activities. In this conviction, I see three priorities. The highest priority must be given to the victims of sexual abuse. We owe to them as victims of serious crimes our concern and care. We must listen to them so they have a space where they can speak about their suffering. Secondly, the principle of zero tolerance must be rigorously applied to the perpetrators of abuse so that offenders are reported and crimes are not concealed. This also means that the penal code in our church, which has become blunted in recent decades, must be resolved and sharpened. Thirdly, every effort must be given to prevention so that such crimes cannot be repeated within the Catholic Church. In a church which consists of sinners, there can of course never be an absolute guarantee but I'm convinced that with these three points, the priority of care for the victims, the rigorous implementation of serotolerance, and comprehensive prevention, with these three points, we can be found out of this profound crisis in which our Roman Catholic Church finds itself. I apologize for this short word about the situation for beginning my conference about ecumenical engagements. Where is ecumenical movement today? This at first glance innocuous question conceals the usually unspoken suspicion that ecumenism today is in fact standing still and going nowhere. There is often talk of a standstill or even a winter Frost in ecumenism. I do not share this diagnosis, but I am on the contrary convinced that the ecumenical movement does indeed move because it is alive. This is true, above all, when one looks to ecumenism worldwide. That is, of course, a pleonasm, for according to its original meaning, ecumene means encompassing the entire globe. A communism certainly does in fact take place in the first instance in the concrete location where Christians live and is conducted as conversation with individual partners. Concrete local communism can however only gain from also directing, directing its attention also to more comprehensive ecumenical processes, for ecumenism has from its inception been a worldwide movement. This is true, at least of the Catholic Church, where at the Second Vatican Council, at the end of the third session, more precisely on 21st November 1964, the decree on ecumenism unitatis red integratio was adopted by the Council Fathers with an overwhelming majority of 2,000 
137 yes votes against only 11 no votes. And promulgated by blessed and soon saints, Pope Paul VI. With this event, a half century ago, the Catholic Church made the fundamental cause of the ecumenical movement its own, joining it officially and definitively. The aptness of this assessment is indicated by the fact that the promulgated text no longer speaks of Catholic ecumenism, as in the draft, the Ecumenismo of 1963, but of Catholic principles on ecumenism. This new terminology gives expression to the fact that the Council did not intend to establish an ecumenism of its own, a Catholic special pass alongside or even against the ecumenical movement that had arisen within non-Catholic Christianity, but in the conviction that there can only be one ecumenism intended to integrate itself into the process of the ecumenical movement, which the Council expressly attributed to the inspiring grace of the Holy Spirit. When one looks back to the promulgation of the decree on ecumenism after more than 50 years, one cannot but express gratitude for what the Second Vatican Council initiated and for the fruits gained from it over the past half century. Among the most important fruits of the ecumenical endeavor, one can surely together with Pope John Paul II count the rediscovered brotherhood among Christians and Christian communities. The numerous encounters, various conversation and reciprocal visits have fostered the growth of a network of friendly relations between the various churches which forms the constructive foundation for ecumenical dialogues. Since then, the Catholic Church has conducted and continues to conduct such dialogues with almost all Christian churches and ecclesial communities. Beginning with the Assyrian Church of the East and the Oriental Orthodox Churches, such as the Copts, Armenians, and Syrians, through the Orthodox churches of the Byzantine and Slavic tradition, on to the churches and communities that emerged from the Reformation, such as the Lutherans, the Reformed, the Methodist, and the Anglican Communion, to the old Catholics and the various free churches, and finally by evangelical and Pentecostal communities that have grown so enormously in the 20th and early 21st centuries. Many positive fruits have been harvested from these dialogues, as Cardinal Walter Kasper has presented in his book, Harvesting the Fruits. But with all these positive results, it must be said that the real goal of the ecumenical movement, namely the restoration of the unity of the church, or full ecclesial communion has not yet been achieved. That is, however, what the decree on ecumenism sees as the goal of all ecumenical endeavor. And this is the goal the great council Paul, popes have worked towards. This is true, above all, of Saint Pope John XXIII and the vision he had for the Second Vatican Council which notably became apparent to him during the week of prayer for Christian unity. The two chief concerns that moved him to call the council were for him intimately interconnected, namely the renewal of the Catholic Church and the restoration of Christian unity. The Pope was convinced that the Catholic Church could only be renewed if the ecumenical cause was given a position of priority. He had set this in train primarily by founding the Secretariat for Christian Unity, 
already two years before the opening of the Council, entrusting the task of its leadership of the Jesuit Augustin Bea, who was later justly honored with the title Cardinal of Unity and Cardinal of Ecumenism and Dialogue. The great council pope, Paul VI, was also convinced of the indissoluble nexus between these two great causes. The ecumenical cause was an important leitmotiv for him, also and above all with regard to the conciliar renewal of the Catholic Church and its self-understanding. So to such a degree that one has to speak of an actual reciprocal interaction between the ecumenical opening of the Catholic Church and the renewal of its ecclesiology. In this sense, Paul VI emphasized already at the beginning of the second period in his fundamental opening address that the ecumenical rapprochement between separated Christians and churches was one of the central goals, as it were, the spiritual drama for which the Second Vatican Council had been called. And at the promulgation of the decree on ecumenism, Paul VI maintained that this decree explained and completed the dogmatic constitution of the Church. This formulation expresses unmistakably that Paul VI in no way esteemed the decree on ecumenism as theologically inferior, but rather ranked it alongside the dogmatic constitution on the Church in its theological significance. In view of the recently reawakened tendency to question or at least minimize the theological binding force of the decree on ecumenism, it is especially relevant to recall this important decision of Pope Paul VI. The popes, since the council, too, have continued this open trajectory, fostering and deepening the ecumenical concern. They have constantly oriented the goal of the ecumenical movement toward the description in the Acts of the Apostle of the original congregation in Jerusalem where it is said of the first Christian that they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of, breaking of the bread and to the prayers. There are three elements, above all, that appear constitutive for the unity of the church, namely unity in the faith, in celebrating worship and in fraternal community. Upon this biblical foundation, the unity of the Church is understood as unity in faith, in the sacraments and in the life of the community with their called witnesses, which also comprises ecclesial ministers. This concept of ecclesial unity from which the Catholic Church takes its orientation has also been received in the ecumenical movement by the World Council of Churches, describes as its primary purpose in Article 3 of its constitution to call the churches, I quote, to visible unity in one phase and in one Eucharistic fellowship expressed in worship and common life in Christ through witness and service to the world and to advance toward the unity in order that the word may be believed. The ecumenical movement depends on its partner having a common goal in view and taking joint steps toward this goal. Already in 1980, the International Lutheran Roman Catholic Commission on Unity expressed this conviction in its consensus text, Ways to Community, Wege zur Gemeinschaft with these clear cited words, I quote, we need a common vision because we shall grow further apart if we do not aim towards a common goal. If we have conflicting views of this goal, we shall, if we are consistent, move in opposite directions. 
if there is no consensus within the ecumenical movement on its goal, if the various partners in ecumenism understand very differently what constitutes the unity of the church, there is an imminent danger that the ecumenical partners stride ahead in different directions, only to discover later that they have possibly distanced themselves from one another even more than they were before. This danger has by no means diminished over recent decades, but instead forms part of the profound developments and challenges that have appeared within the ecumenical movement over the past half century, to which we must now turn our attention. The most changements and um, challenges that we have in the ecumenical situation today, the first challenge is lack of consensus on the goal of ecumenism. In the course of time, the goal of ecumenism has become increasingly unclear since no really workable agreement has been achieved as yet between the various churches and ecclesial communities and previous partial consensus in this regard has in part been called into question. The elementary challenge in the ecumenical situation today must be diagnosed as the twofold circumstance that on the one hand, in the previous phases of ecumenical dialogues, wide-ranging and welcome convergences and consensus have been achieved on many contentious individual questions on the understanding of the faith and the theological structure of the church. While on the other hand, however, most remaining points of difference have consolidated around the unchanging, diversely determined, determined understandings of the ecumenical unity of the church per se. This twofold circumstance represents the real paradox of the current ecumenic, ecumenical situation, which one can define more precisely in the diagnosis of Bishop Paul Werner Scherle. We are united on the that of unity, but not on the what of unity. This difficulty is further intensified by the fact that the ecumenical search for church unity is today exposed to a strong headwind in the predominantly pluralist and relativist spirit of our times that has become such a matter of course today. In contrast to the Christian tradition in which according to the theological axiom ens et unum convertuntur, unity was considered the meaning and foundation of reality per se. Pluralism has to a great extent become the crucial fundamental concept in the perception of the so-called postmodern experience of reality today. According to the well-known essay La Condition Postmoderne by Jean-François Lyotard, postmodernism means the acceptance of the plural and the sus suspicion of any singular. The basic assumption of postmodern mentality states that we neither can for may turn our minds back to before the plurality of reality if we do not want to expose ourselves to the suspicion of a totalitarian mindset. Indeed, plurality is seen as the only way in which the whole can be apprehended, if at all. This fundamental abandonment of the idea of unity is characteristic of postmodernism, which is not only the acceptance and tolerance of plurality, but rather an option for pluralism on principle. To this postmodern mentality, the ecumenical search for unity appears unmodern and antiquated. Furthermore, this postmodern mentality has even found acceptance within the ecumenical thinking of the present and has taken effect in a widespread ecclesiological pluralism 
according to which the multiplicity and diversity of churches is considered as a positive reality and any search for unity of the church seems to be suspicious. It seems that people have not only come to terms with the historically developed and continuing pluralism of churches and ecclesial communities, but in principle even welcome it so that the ecumenical quests for visible unity of the church seems to be unrealistic and is not valid as desirable. It is not unusual to attempt to justify this renunciation of the search for the unity of the church on scriptural grounds, by referring, for example, to the often repeated thesis of the Protestant New Testament scholar Ernst Kesemann, whereby he attempts to legitimate also the great church, schisme, with the claim that the New Testament canon does not as establish the unity of the church, but the multiplicity of the confessions. It seems an anachronistic enterprise to transmit back into New Testament the current historical, historically developed situation of separated and coexistent denominationally defini defined churches and ecclesial communities and for that reason, Walter Cardinal Kasper has rightly claimed in view of Kesemann's thesis, I quote, for St. Paul, such a coexistence and a pluralism of various and differing confessional churches would have been a totally invirable concept. Nevertheless, this thesis by Kesemann is still taken up today when, for example, the Council of the Evangelical Church of Germany refers to it in its foundation text on the Reformation commemoration of 2017 in order to interpret the churches of the Reformation as a part of the legitimate because in conformity with scripture pluralization of Christian churches and to laud it as a welcome after effect of the 16th century Reformation. Even more, far-reaching and radical is the thesis postulated above all by the liberal wing of Protestant theology, that the Reformation had at last initiated the pluralization of Latin Christianity, which has seen taken shape in the permanent competition between independent confessional churches that in the form of Protestantism has made Christianity compatible with modernity and must not be called into question by a new search for unity. The Protestant church historian Christoph Marxis has therefore rightly pointed out that these liberal streams within Protestantism has, have difficulty with the ecumenical movement since for them Reformation Christendom is often considered a categorically different type of religion of its own divorced from the rest of Christendom and in conformity with the modern area and not as often in Revelation today, part of the one holy and universal church, which indeed passed through the Reformation, but remains bound multiple commonalities and theological lines of tradition with the Uda Sancta Ecclesia. These examples document the fact that the ecumenical search for unity of the church take place today in a radically altered context in theological thinking in the sense that the multiplicity of churches is no longer considered from the perspective of historical schism and the unity of the church that is to be restored, but rather as a historical develop enhancement of the being of the church. On that basis, fundamental reservations are expressed against an understanding of unity in which the multiformity of churches, even though it's the result of division, is not seen primarily as an enrichment. Together with this option for the plurality of churches, a paradigm shift in the theology of ecumenism is also postulated and practiced, in which 
the previously applied method, which is decisively consensus-oriented and constantly seeks to arrive at a differentiated consensus, is today called into question. This method means that on the one hand, the conversions reached in dialogue on the basis substance of the doctrine previously contested between the churches is formulated, and what can be jointly stated is jointly articulated. And on the other hand, the remaining differences are named just as clearly, and in the process it is demonstrated that they do not call into question the reached basis consensus, and that they no longer need to be perceived as church-dividing differences, but can be handed on for further theological study. This ecumenical method, which is intended to serve the restoration of the unity of the church and has brought forth good fruits, is today variously criticized to the extent that the end of so-called consensus ecumenism has been proclaimed in order to be replaced by a so-called difference ecumenism. It can be readily understood that within this conceptual context, the question of the unity of the church and full communion is reformulated. Within this context, we see one crucial cause for the failure to achieve a practicable agreement on the goal of ecumenism. This has its basis essentially in the fact that the quite diverse denominationally determined conception of the church and its unity continue to coexist unreconciled beside one another, as they did at the outset, outset. Since each church or ecclesial community has and realizes its own specific concept of the being of the church and its unity, it also strives to transfer these confessional concepts to the level of the goal of ecumenism, so, so that there are ultimately as many ideas of the ecumenical goal as there are denominational ecclesiologies. This means that the lack of a consensus on the goal of the ecumenical movement is not inessentially grounded in the lack of an ecumenical consensus on the nature of the church and its unity. The Catholic Church, together with the Orthodox Church, holds fast to the original shared goal of visible unity in the faith, in the sacraments, and the ecclesial ministries. By contrast, not a few of churches and communities that emerged from the Reformation have to a great degree given up these originally shared concepts of unity in favor of a postulated reciprocal recognition of the various ecclesial realities as churches and therefore as parts of the one church of Jesus, Jesus Christ. This postulate does not as such insist on an in principle invisibility of the unity of the church, but then the visible unity of the church consists in the addition of all present church's realities. And in this sense, considering that the diverse conception of the ecumenical goal grounded in the different denominational ecclesiology leads inevitably to the consequence that an ecumenical clarification of the understanding of the church and its unity must be the central theme of current and future ecumenical dialogues. A constructive path in this direction is provided by the Face and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches in its study, The Church Toward a Common Vision. It strives for a global, multilateral, and ecumenical vision of the nature, purpose, and mission of the Church and can be evaluated in an ecumenical perspective as a valuable ecclesiological in via declaration. Nevertheless, even this deserving study cannot lead the theological agreement on most of the previously controversial ecclesiological issues beyond any further 
than to formulation of still open questions, but it does demonstrate in which direction further work is required in the ecumenical dialogues. The multiplicity of ecumenical goal concepts is correlated with the further phenomenon that the churches and ecclesial communities originating in the Reformation have in the main time de developed into a virtually pluriverse in which we find at the global level increasing fragmentation and multiple splintering processes and only marginal striving towards greater unity with one another. This phenomenon finds further confirmation in the more recent past in the appearance of new dialogue partners in the ecumenical movement. Ecumenical encounters and dialogues today take place not only between the historical mainstream churches above all of the West, but increasingly with many new Christians' movements predominantly in the Protestant fear, above all with the so-called free churches, who have preempted the future that also increasingly clearly awaits the historical churches, namely freedom and independence from the state or the end of the inherited Constantinian Christianity and which therefore represent yet another conception of ecumenical unity. Of particular significance is the rapid and numerically strong growth of evangelical and charismatic groupings and of Pentecostal movements in the southern hemisphere, but in the meantime also in other continents. With approximately 500 million members, Pentecostalism forms numerically the second largest Christian community after the Roman Catholic Church. This represents such an expanding phenomenon that one has to speak of a current Pentecostalization of Christendom, or may be inclined to apprehend it as a false mode of being Christians, namely beside the Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox churches, the Catholic Church and the churches and ecclesial communities resulting from the Reformation. The rapid growth of the so-called Pentecostal churches represents one of the fundamental challenges of the ecumenical situation today, which Pope Benedict XVI referred to not by chance in his meeting with representatives of the Council of the Evangelical Church in Germany in the Augustinian Cloister in Herford in September 2011 in these sensitive words, I quote, faced with a new form of Christianity which is spreading with overpowering missionary dynamism, sometimes in frightening ways, the mainstream Christian denominations often seem at a loss. This is a form of Christianity with little institutional depth, little rationality, and even less dogmatic content, and with little stability. This worldwide phenomenon that bishops from all over the world are constantly ten telling me about poses a question to us all. What is this new form of Christianity saying to us, for better and for worse? In any event, it raises afresh the question about what has enduring validity and what can or most be changed, the question of our fundamental faith choice. With these insights and questions, Pope Benedict XVI put a concrete name to the challenge to ecumenism represented by the global phenomenon of Pentecostalism. The most elementary challenge consists in the fact that with Pentecostalism, a new type of being church has entered the field in which the charismatic dimension of faith and life in the community play a significant role. Albert Peter Reitman has characterized this new type as the origin of a church type based on individual decision and understanding itself more as a movement 
than as an organization and hierarchy that is speaking in Christian terms as a decidedly brotherly and sisterly community. Regarding the ecclesial structure of the historically developed mainstream churches, Rettmann even speaks of two contrasting church models which should reciprocally interrogate one another and must also without doubt form a subject of ecumenical dialogue in which in any case the clarification of the understanding of the church constitute one of the primary agenda items in the current situation. Not least, the phenomenon of Pentecostalism brings to light the fact that in recent decades the worldwide geography of Christianity has changed radically and the ecumenical situation has become more unfathomable and not in least simpler. It is easy to grasp that in ecumenical dialogue with these new movements, different agenda items than in the dialogues with mainstream churches occupy the foreground, and that once more a new bandwidth of ecumenical goal concepts presented itself. Since this fact has not inessential cause in the addition of new ecumenical partners, the increasing pluralization of ideas of the ecumenical goal need not be formulated simply as a problem, but can even be seen positively in the estimation of the Berlin Protestant Church historian Marchis. I quote, the fact that the goal of the ecumenical movement has become less clear than it was originally can also be understood as the, of course, unintentional consequence of the success of the ecumenical movement. In the meantime, so many people are engaged in the ecumenical movement that the already initially diverse goals have simply become further pluralized on the basis of the number of Christian people who have an interest in ecumenism. Another profound shift in the ecumenical situa situation cannot go unremarked. It has its essential basis in the fact that within the World Council of Churches, the motto that its first home in the ecumenical movement for practical Christianity, life and work, affirming that Christ divides Christians while their actions and their ethical praxis unite them, has become increasingly the guideline of the ecumenical movement as a whole. The consequent engagement of the World Council of Churches above all in so-called secular ecumenism was of course even at the time subject to harsh criticism. For example, in the evaluation of the Munich Protestant theologian Wolfgang Pannenberg, I quote, nothing divides Christian today as bitterly as the dispute over a praxis which the one proclaims to be a faith, praxis while the others it appears to be expression of uncritical adaptation of an unchristian ideology. The slogan that faith divides while action unites has in the meantime virtually turned upside down in the ecumenical situation. It must appear quite paradoxical that while it has in previous ecumenical dialogues been possible in part to overcome old confessional contradiction in the face, or at least to approach rapprochement, today great differences emerge in ethical questions. For in recent years and decades, great, great divergences and massive tensions have appeared within the ecumenical landscape in the ethical sphere. Divergent frames of reference can be observed in the various Christian churches and ecclesial communities, for example, on bioethical and social ethical challenges and on the problems involving marriage and family and sexuality within the horizon of the gender mainstream today and are considered quite polarizing also within the different churches themselves. These developments 
imply a great challenge for Christian ecumenism. If Christian churches and ecclesial communities cannot speak with one voice on the great ethical question of today's world, the Christian voice is increasingly weakened in today's secularized societies, damaging the credibility of Christian ecumenism as a whole in the current public sphere. Christian ecumenism must therefore also grapple with the ethical questions of human life and social coexistence and seek new consensus. And since the ethical issues in most cases involve fundamental questions regarding the image of mankind, one great task confronting ecumenism today may, today may well consist in developing a joint ecumenical Christian anthropology. When one reviews the developments and challenges within ecumenism discussed here, that are signs of a strong preference for the pluralization of Christianity. The question of unity rises its head once more with new emphasis. For without the search for unity, not only ecumenism, but Christianity itself would be surrendered as the epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians expresses with the desirable clarity, and quote, one body and one spirit, as you were also called to the one hope of your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Since unity is and remains a fundamental category of the Christian faith, we Christians must have the courage and the humility, a look, the scandal of still divided Christendom, in the A and with amiable stubbornness keep alive the question of Christian unity. We Christians are called to greater unity in another deeply existential way in the world of today, where Christians are persecuted to an extent that has little historical parallel. Today, there is a greater persecution of Christian than in the first centuries. 80% of all those who are persecuted for their faith are Christians. The Christian faith is the most persecuted of all religions today. This harrowing statistic represents a great challenge to demonstrate sympathetic solidarity with persecuted Christians and to closer unity among all Christians. Today, all churches and ecclesial communities have their martyrs. Today, Christians are not persecuted because they are Orthodox or Catholics, Lutheran or Anglican or Methodist, but because they are Christians. Today, martyrdom is ecumenical, is one can indeed speak of ecumenism of the martyrs. Pope John Paul II devoted special attention to this notably in his encyclical on the commitment to ecumenism ut unum sind, seeing in it a positive message despite all the tragedy of the persecution of Christians. He perceived in it already a fundamental Christian unity in the conviction of faith that the martyrs would assist us to find full communion once more. For while we Christians and churches here on earth still stand in an imperfect communion towards and with one another, the martyrs in their heavenly glory already live a full and perfect communion. The courageous martyrs of the past and present centuries are for Pope John Paul II the most powerful proof that every factor of division can be transcended and overcome in the total gift of self for the sake of the gospel. The blood that the martyrs shed for Christ today does not divide us Christians, but instead unites us in an existential manner in the faith. In the ecumenism of the martyrs, we encounter a beautiful promise Early church was convinced that the blood of martyrs is the seed of new Christians. 
Today, too, we as Christians may live in the hope that the blood of the ecumenical martyrs in our time will one day prove to be the seed of the full unity of the one body of Christ, wounded by so many church schism. We can be convinced that we Christians have already become one in the blood of the martyrs and that the suffering of so many Christians establish unity that will prove be, to be stronger than the differences that still divide Christian churches. In the ecumenism of the martyrs, we can perceive the most convincing sign of ecumenism today, which, however, confronts us with the disquieting question posed by Pope Francis, I quote, if the enemy unites us in this, how are we to be divided in life? It is not instead shameful that those who persecute Christians sometimes have a better ecumenical visions than we Christians ourselves, for they know that we Christians belong together inseparably. In the ecumenism of the martyrs, the existential urgency of the ecumenical search for the unity of the church confronts us, and in it one can see focused as under a magnifying glass of all challenges facing ecumenism today and in the future. In responding to these great challenges, we not only cast back to the beginnings of our understanding, but also refer back to the beginnings of the ecumenical movement. It therefore seems appropriate to reflect on the beginning of the ecumenical movement and the three elementary dimensions in which it has been realized and continues to be realized in order to chart our way into the future. The ecumenical movement was in the first instance a prayer movement. This characteristic was expressed by Pope Benedict in the vivid metaphor. The ship of ecumenism would never have put out the sea had she not been lifted by his broad current of prayer and wafted by the breath of the Holy Spirit. Indeed, the week of prayer for the unity of Christians stood at the beginning of the ecumenical movement and was an ecumenical initiative. We need to constantly bear in mind that it was the prayer for unity that opened the way for the ecumenical movement. The Second Vatican Council identified spiritual ecumenism as the heart of all ecumenical endeavor and the soul of the ecumenical movement. With that, it gave expression to the fact that the ecumenical task is above all a spiritual exercise and that there can therefore be no unity without prayer, as Pope Francis stresses again and again, I quote, the ecumenical commitment responds firstly to the prayer of the Lord Jesus himself and is based primarily in prayer. With this prayer for unity, we Christians give expression to our faith conviction that unity cannot be effected primarily through our efforts and absolutely not through our efforts alone. We cannot create unity of ourselves, nor determine its form or its time frame. We Christians can produce divisions, as both history and the present time demonstrate. But unity we can only allow to be bestowed on us. The prayer for unity reminds us that we Christians must leave room for the working of the Holy Spirit, which is not at our disposal, and place our trust in the Holy Spirit at least as much in our own efforts. The best preparation for receiving unity as the gift of the Holy Spirit is the prayer for unity. The ecumenical prayer movement of a century ago does not simply represent the beginning that we can leave behind. It is rather a beginning that must accompany all ecumenical efforts still today. 
credible ecumenism stands or falls with the depths of its spiritual power and the voices of Christian joining in the high priestly prayer of Jesus that all may be one. The ecumenical movement was secondly a conversion movement, taking its starting point from the sensitive perception of the sin of schisma in the church. Looking back to the history of the ecumenical movement reveals that new impulses have always been made possible when Christians in the various churches have summoned up the courage and the humility to look the present scandal of the divided Christendom in the A and heed to call to conversion. For we Christians will only find the unity that is already granted to us in Christ when we together turn to Jesus Christ. Conversion is the elixir of life of true ecumenism. As the Council's decree on ecumenism formulated it programmatically. I quote, there can be no ecumenism worthy of the name without a change of heart. For it is from renewal of the inner life of our minds from self-denial and unstinted love that desires of unity take their rise and develop in a major, major way. In his encyclical on the commitment to ecumenism, St. John Paul II stressed that the entire decree on ecumenism was permitted by the spirit of conversion. In the first instance, that of course involves not the conversion of others, but our own conversion, which presumes the willingness to self-critically perceive one's own weaknesses and, def and deficit deficits, to humbly confess them, to take measure from the gospel of Jesus Christ, and to serve the restoration of Christian unity. Conversion must therefore be primarily conversion to the passionate search for the unity of all Christians. This is the true meaning of unitatis redintegratio. The ecumenical movement was thirdly a mission movement. This dimension is evident already at its beginning, namely the first World Mission Conference in Edinburgh, Scotland, in 1910. The participants at this conference were faced with the scandal that the various Christian churches and ecclesial communities were competing in their mission work to the detriment of credible proclamation of the gospel, above all in distant culture because they imported into other cultures the European church division together with the gospel. They had therefore become aware of the painful fact that the division within Christendom forms the most difficult obstacle for world mission. In the same spirit, the Second Vatican Council too had the courage to call the continuing division of Christianity a scandal that give, gave offense to the world and harmed the proclamation of the Christian message. If the disunity among Christians is the counter-testimony to the proclamation of the gospel. Then, in reverse, ecumenical reconciliation is the fundamental prerequisite for the credible mission of the church. An honest and therefore ecumenically united witness to Jesus Christ is only possible in today's world if the Christian churches overcome their divisions and live in a unity of reconciled diversity. Ecumenism and mission, therefore, belong indissolubly together and reciprocally require and foster one another. A missionary church is spontaneously an ecumenical church, and an ecumenical engaged church forms the fundamental precondition for a missionary church. Commitment to the unity which helps them to accept Jesus Christ is therefore in the eyes of Pope Francis no longer a matter of mere diplomacy or forced compliance, 
but rather an indispensable path to evangelization. The ecumenical movement was from the very start a prayer movement, a conversion movement, and a mission movement. These movements have made an essential contribution to the progress of the ecumenical movement over the past 50 years. These three movements must also remain vital in the future if the ecumenical movement wishes to confront the challenging facing it today. For it is self-evident that there is simply no alternative to ecumenism. It is the emergency response for the credibility of the Christian faith and the mission of the church in the world of today. It fulfills the will of the Lord and is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, as the Second Vatican Council confessed. It would therefore be a sign of little faith if we did not trust the Holy Spirit to bring to fruition what that which is to promisingly initiated, of course, in the manner at the time of its choosing. To listen to the Holy Spirit is the call of the ecumenical hour today. I thank you for your passions and your attentions. working. Oh, there we go. If anyone has any questions, if you would write them on the cards and then pass them to the ends of the pews. And while you are doing that, I have a question. So you spoke of the goals with the Eastern churches as being visible unity, of the Reformation churches that there's this plurality that the church wants to see everyone recognized as a church and that that be the whole body of Christ. I wasn't sure on the goal with the Pentecostal churches and the new evangelical churches. I'm wondering what is the goal of the Catholic church in all of these ecumenical efforts? Yes, I think with the Oriental Orthodox churches and the Orthodox churches, we share the same vision of the goal as the visible unity in faith and sacraments and ministries. In the dialogues with the churches that come from the Reformation, we must refine a common vision of the goal because I know many Lutherans reformed, they share the same vision of the goal as we Catholics, but a few of Protestant churches and ecclesial communities have another vision, the mutual recognition of all the realities, church realities, as churches. And the addition of all these church realities is considered as the one church of Christ. And this is a very different goal, vision of the goal. With the Pentecostals, we must search what is your vision of unity. And in this sense, for me, the, the dialogue with the Pentecostal is a very great challenge. And in this sense, I have planned, next week we have the plenary of our Pontifical Council in Rome with the presence of all the bishops over the world. And the main theme is the Pentecostalism and the search for unity. And I hope after two weeks, I can have a better response. <laughs> one, just one quick thing, and this is, I told you when we were driving in the car today that I was going to ask you a question about the scandal in the church today. Do you see that the scandal of the sex abuse scandal in the United States, but all over the world, is impacting the ecumenical movement? I don't hope. 
that we have consequences for the ecumenical movement, then I think a light motif for an ecumenical engagement is the very beautiful word of St. Paul. When one member of the body of Christ is suffering, we suffer in with them. And when they have joy, we are enjoying with them. And in this sense, incredible ecumenism is present when we have a sympathy also for the suffering of the other churches. And in this sense, I think we need also the, the help of other churches for overcome this tragic situation and these crimes in, in our church. But um, I think that is very important. Pope Francis had uh, wrote an, a letter about this issue and had called to all Catholics to help to overcome these problems. And I think we can said also we can invite all Christians to help us to overcome this crisis. We have a number of questions from the audience. I like this one. What do you believe is the role of lay people, women, and young people in helping us all be one? This is the first movement I have defined the ecumenical movement as a prayer movement, as a spiritual movement. And the Second Vatican Council said clearly that the responsibility for the unity of the Christians is not only a responsibility of the hierarchy of the bishops and the Pope, but belongs to all baptized. All baptized are in, must be engaged for the unity of the church. And the fundamental task for help to refine the unity is the prayer for unity. Because the fundamental of all ecumenical engagement is the high priestly prayer to Jesus Christ. In the 17th chapter by, John, by the evangelist John, he said he prayed that all may be one. It's very impressive. Jesus doesn't command the unity to his disciples. He prayed for the unity. And when Jesus prays for the unity, what we can do better than praying for the unity? And the second reality, to have a better knowledge to one another. In the different parishes, to have meetings and to have a better knowledge from the other uh, Christians. And we can have the better knowledge from the other when we see him, experience him praying. As we and our separated brethren agree on two sacraments, baptism and Eucharist, should not shared Eucharist be the natural beginnings for all baptized Christians? Not all not Catholic churches have only two sacraments. I have made the experience in uh, Sweden I visited a very beautiful church. In this war, also rooms for confession. And I asked the minister there, is this a Catholic church? And he said, why do you have the impression it's a Catholic church? It's a Lutheran church. And I said, but the rooms for, for confession. And he said, who has, where you have learned that Luther has canceled the sacrament of confession? In this sense, but also the Catholic tradition make a clear difference between the basic sacraments and the other sacraments. And the basic sacraments are baptism and Eucharist. And in this sense, we have just a consensus to refine the better unity. But uh, the question is uh, the Eucharist. I think we, here we have a different vision for many Protestant uh, Christians the sharing of the um, uh, Eucharist is a force on the way to refine the unity. For us Catholics, and I think more for Orthodox, the Eucharistic communion is the goal of ecumenical uh, situation. We search to first 
the ecclesial communion and then the Eucharistic communion. This is the difference in the dialogue between Protestants and Catholics. As a student, what can I do to bring religious peoples together in a real way? How we can? Bring religious peoples together in a real way. This is not my responsibility. <laughs> because we make must do a clear difference between the ecumenical dialogue and the interreligious dialogue. And this is not the same case because the goal of the two dialogues is not the same. The goal of ecumenical dialogue is to find the unity between the Christians. This cannot be the goal of interreligious dialogue. We cannot search unity between Muslims, uh, Jews, and uh, Buddhist and other religions. But the goal of the interreligious dialogue is to have a better knowledge from one another and to collaborate together for peace and justice in this world. Uh, and to confess that the sister of religion is in no case violence, but peace. This is the dialogue. And in this sense, young people are engaged to refine uh, a better knowledge of other religions and to collaborate uh, together for a better world. So here's the question. Um, from what I see, unification between the Catholic and Orthodox Church is less theological and mostly political. How do you see the rift between the Russian slash Ukrainian Greek Orthodox churches affecting the ecumenical movement? Uh, first of all, I would say that the main reason of, for the division in the 11th century is in first instance not theologically and politically but a um, mutual est est estrangement between East and West. We Christians in the East and in the West doesn't understand one another. Mm. And this is a main, and then there are deep and theological questions uh, after. This question is a very difficult uh, question and perhaps it is better when an Orthodox give a response of this very difficult situation because for me it's very sad that we have now today this conflict between Constantinople and Moscow um, over all in the situation of the Ukraine. And it's clear that damage also our dialogue because Moscow has decided that he doesn't, the Patriarchate of Moscow doesn't participate in an ecumenical dialogue who is presided by a representative of the Church of Constantinople. And next November, we have the meeting of the Coordination Committee of the International Mixed Commission between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Churches. And it, it seems to be that the uh, representative from the Orthodox Patriarchate of Moscow doesn't participate. And then we have a very difficult situation. And in this sense, we must pray that we can refine the better unity between the Orthodox uh, churches. And when we can help, what we can do, we will do it. One more, and then we'll have to close for the evening. Any advice on how churches should deal with declining membership? How do you think we can best attract and recruit younger members who are found to be more drawn to the mega churches? Okay. Stefan is up here to do some translating into German when a question is not quite understandable. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. 
I have another definition of easy. <laughs> um, I know a very beautiful phrase from Pope Benedict XVI in his homily by the um, um, opening of the um, General Assembly of the La, um, Pontific uh, Episcopate of Latin America. He said, Christian faith grows no with proselytism, but with attraction. And I think it is also can be the response for this question. We must be attractive. Attractive in a positive way. That we give a, a good example, we have a good witness of the gospel, that the young people have the impression, this is my church. And when they go to the mega churches, I don't know these realities very fine, because I don't, I don't understand very well the question, they go and make the experience, and then we can try to have a discussion what they experience there. I have also the impression with the, in the dialogue with the Pentecostals, first of all, it must be a self-critical question for us, because so many members of the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches in Latin America leave the church and go to the Pentecostal moment. Why? What is failure by us? Huh? And then we can find many uh, problems and many uh, reasons, because the Pentecostal has a very closeness in the pastoral situation. We are sometimes a little distant. In Latin, Latin America, the pastor visits the parish twice in the year. It's not a great closeness to the people. And a second reality, the Pentecostals have a um, great uh, hope of the working of the Holy Spirit. And we Western Christians must ask you, uh, our themselves, how is our pneumatology? Do we very believe on the work of the Holy Spirit in our personal life, in our ecclesial communities, and in all over the world in the creation by the salvation of the creation is very important today. And I think in the same day, the same thing we must ask the young people, what do you find in these mega churches? What do you not find? And in this sense, we have the ecumenism of conversion. Thank you, Cardinal Koch, for being with us this evening. The Aquinas Center is most grateful to Cardinal Koch's presence with us this week. His words of wisdom that we first recognize where we are, we are united and then we can deal with what might divide us. And his work towards recognizing the gifts of other churches and faiths. We thank each of you for coming tonight and for your thoughtfulness as we move toward full communion, knowing that hope colors all the obstacles and challenges before us. Have a safe trip home, and may your weeks ahead be blessed. <laughs>